Good to go. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome here this morning. And thank you very much for inviting me here. To, uh, today is my second visit to Seoul, uh, Korea, uh, this year, uh, keynoting at a conference. So I hope I can share something of value with you. Uh, but again, thank you very much for your hospitality. So my story uh, began in this space uh, basically in 2012, 2013, I was uh, mentoring some students at universities across uh, Canada, startup weekends, stuff, and everyone suddenly wanted to do Bitcoin. And like everybody else, my first question was, what is Bitcoin? They gave me the Satoshi white paper to read, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, today, I give a, a talk every Friday live in China, uh, sponsored by China TV and on the social media, which I think when we started was the first live TV show dedicated to blockchain uh, in the world. So we have a very large audience there, and uh, China is a whole different story, uh, totally embracing blockchain and moving forward quite aggressively applying the technology, which I hope to see in Korea as well. But I'll explain for a number of reasons I travel widely. Uh, I've just done six countries in two weeks, where I've been talking from Boston to Malta to Zurich to Madrid to Paris and, and arrived here last night. So I've got a lot to share, uh, very little time in which to cover it, but as you can see from my history, uh, been involved in, in quite a few aspects of this. And today I'm also involved in the executive chairman of a, an exchange. And I know you hear a lot about exchanges. Uh, when we first started with Bitcoin, everyone was producing wallets. Uh, today, everyone's doing exchanges. But we're quite unique, very different in the landscape and trying to stay ahead of the game, which is a very interesting and evolving one and I know is preoccupying your regulator as we speak. So my claim to fame is in 2013, we launched in Vancouver, BC, which is my hometown in Canada, uh, the first Bitcoin ATM in the world. And to show you the interest, we talk about bubbles today, but in the first month, that one ATM had revenue of over a million Canadian dollars. So the team that I was advising uh, who put this together literally didn't know what to do with the cash. No bank would take the cash. Uh, they physically couldn't do anything with it. Um, so we had to set up a financial mechanism. We brought PwC in to advise the team and work out how do we audit this and how do we do KYC and AML properly, which I'll explain shortly. But that's how I got involved quite directly in the industry itself. And all of this ended up launching the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada and finally the Blockchain Association of Canada, of which I'm the past chairman. So you've seen this picture before, but very interestingly, this drawing comes from a RAND Corporation, which became part of IBM in 1964, really. People were puzzling over, should things be centralized, decentralized, or something in between, distributed? The interesting fact is today, and, and I might say, say some things that to the traditional blockchain community, the so-called maximalists, as we call them, might sound heretical, but the majority of applications of, if I can point, um, of blockchain today is in private blockchains. Three quarters of all the commercial applications of blockchain today is by IBM, which leads Microsoft and Accenture. Surprise, surprise, commercial applications of blockchain across the world. Uh, so blockchain is being used in different forms and fashions. There's no one blockchain fits all solution, and that's the emerging picture. But yes, on the other side, we have, um, oops, let me just go back, uh, wrong button. We have decentralized applications where people are trying to use peer-to-peer, -peer, specifically in arenas where there isn't enough infrastructure, and you want to be as democratic as possible. But what institutions and governments fear is in that model, if you have rogue actors, which we've had, thanks to Mount Gox and Silk Road and, and, and servers sitting in remote locations in, in nations specifically that might not be sanctioned, 
via Korea or the United States or Canada, where I'm from, how do you deal with that? So that's a concern. And that holds back a bit of the application of the technology and, of course, preoccupies the regulators as we speak. The prevailing model is one of more of a distributed network, which you should all know what that means. That's cloud computing. So we're seeing hybrid models uh, emerging across the board, and that will be the solution set going forward. So what we have, and there's been very strong support for blockchain coming from the World Economic Forum, from the IMF, that truly sees this as the fourth industrial uh, revolutions, one of the founding blocks or cornerstones, if you wish, because there's so much that we can do with this technology. And similar to the evolution of the internet, we're just starting to see, and, and I think today or a few days ago, it's 10 years since the publication of the Satoshi White Paper and the birth, if you wish, of Bitcoin, the first application of a blockchain solution, which is truly revolutionary. So out of this potential, we can create many other foundations, socially, commercially, at government level, and in a variety of applications, which I'll just walk through very, very quickly. I am amazed as I travel the world how much activity is taking place. And we've heard a lot in some terrific uh, previous speakers, especially the, tr the trend analysis slides. It indicates how we've come through this bubble and now we're in some kind of trough of disillusion or whatever the case might be. But the industry, the business of building blockchain solutions never stopped. It was the speculation and the greed and the ICOs that maybe caused that bubble, not blockchain itself. And people tend to equate Bitcoin uh, with blockchain and with ICOs. It's different. It's completely separate and distinct. But in the media, they tend to, to, to be controversial and link them all together. What we have uh, is, thanks to the invention of, the bit, uh, of blockchain, is Bitcoin, the first application, financial application. And the financial sector led in the use of blockchain because Bitcoin was the first application. The vision at the time was that we now have some form of digital cash. We now know it's become more of a store of value. And digital cash, whatever that is going to be eventually, is still emergent. But what we are seeing, don't have time to get into that, we have and that's what our exchange is about. We have nations uh, who want to have their own digital currencies. We're researching that in Canada. Uh, Venezuela, controversially, as you know, has launched their own petrodollar. Uh, there's some Caribbean nations, Bermuda, Barbados, that, that, that we've been engaging with who want to launch their own digital currencies. Malta, Estonia, where we're also setting up offices, all starting to engage at this level. And it's really to make the use of money, especially for trade and investment globally, more frictionless and easy to use. And that has its own implications. And of course, the whole distributed automation, distributed ledgers, and then smart contracts. And to quote Vitalik again, we had him on some previous slides. He regrets having used the word smart contracts. He said in a tweet two days ago, because it's really instruction sets on the blockchain, not so much smart contracts. Uh, smart contracts implies that it can self-execute and do everything by itself, not quite. There are human action and business processes involved, which is what the regulators and governments and enterprise are engaging with as we speak, which is not necessarily bad. So what we have is the vision for blockchain, and I think the initial excitement a few years ago was that it could address very ambitiously um, helping to serve the underserved. One of my projects in my history was working in Africa with Vodafone on M-Pesa. Now, you might have heard of it or might not have heard of it, but M-Pesa was the first application of using airtime on a mobile phone for payment. Payment to merchants, people's salaries in Kenya now get paid in this fashion. 75% of the GDP of Kenya is now processed via these airtime payment uh, mechanisms. So people had the idea that blockchain could come in and play that role as well, and we still need to see those solution sets emerge. I like to coin this term, unbanking the bank. 
in countries like Canada, which has the highest use of credit cards per capita in the world, paying enormous fees, one would imagine that people would embrace Bitcoin and digital currencies, quite the opposite. People's and consumers' behavior tend to stick, and they don't want to move from something that they regard as less risky because it's insured on their credit card, their payments, to Bitcoin. If you lose your money, it's gone. So user experience, making these products and offerings safe and secure. It was an earlier slide as well, which delights me because that's the big challenge going forward, is how do we make these technologies invisible for the average user, uh, but at the same time secure, and they can't lose their money or their identity or whatever the case might be using the blockchain. So other forms, forex and remittances, it's a recurring theme, an opportunity in this space. Uh, the fact instant com and a compliant trade and settlement, one of my customers is Trade and Investment Canada. I received many delegations from Asia, specifically China, who want to invest globally via Canada and other jurisdictions, looking at how they can use blockchain for seamless automation, but baking into that KYC, know your customer, AML, anti-money laundering, fraud prevention, and so forth, which the technology can do. What it has not, what is not caught up with it yet is business processes. People still like to see paper trails, they still want to see validation and verification, and that's blockchain overall's greatest challenge, is the way in which we do things. So we heard about ITOs and token generation events, and I think that was covered exhaustively beforehand. We've rapidly moved beyond that. There's still a wave of uh, initiatives, startups trying to do ICOs. I've just been to Malta. Uh, the conference there had 4,000 people. There's a second conference which I'm speaking at in two weeks in Malta. Again, they're expecting 8,000 people. All of them still trying to do ICOs with white papers. As you've heard, that is problematic. The whole shift, which I'll explain in, in slides to come, is moving towards even past security tokens towards tokenized assets. And I'll unpack that shortly. Very interesting new development that's coming that will change this market and the whole way in which we work with capital forever. Um, and again, I mentioned the IMF's uh, positive stance and position on this. Now, this is a very busy slide. This could keep us here for days, and we don't have enough time, but I just want to highlight to you where blockchain has already found applications across the world, at a national level, at an enterprise level, and op has created opportunities in an industry uh, for startups. And the most important sector is identity and security. Great opportunity, but at the same time, a very controversial one. I was Privileged to uh, be a guest in Shanghai two years ago already with Vitalik and the Ethereum uh, team. Uh, you all must have heard of Ethereum. I was one of the advisors that helped Ethereum literally out of a garage in Toronto go and set up shop in Zug in Switzerland, um, from which it was launched eventually. Last week, or two days ago when I was in Switzerland, I spoke to the leaders of the community there and they said thanks to ICOs and the blockchain that Switzerland attracted as business, they managed to add four billion US dollars to their, to their economy. Incredible benefit to that community and to that jurisdiction, which is why I think a lot of jurisdictions around the world want to become havens for blockchain. I'll leave that on the table. I'm not here to tell Korea what to do. But there's money to be made here, but in, a, in the right way, in a safe way, and, and co protecting consumers at the same time. So back to identity and security. Uh, people assume that blockchain would naturally step into that role. In Europe, for instance, there's, there's a new development. It's called GDPR. The right to be forgotten. The right to have uh, a final say in how your personal identity and information is used. So the argument goes, if my information is immutably and forever held on a blockchain, a public blockchain, which is in the public domain, how can I change or delete information <coughs> that doesn't suit me or doesn't, that, that I don't wish to be made public, or we've moved on from that? Let's say there was a criminal offense and, and people now don't give me a job for that reason and so forth. So still to be figured out. 
in, in China with their smart cities development and they want to use the blockchain to literally manage the energy grids, how people have access to utilities and using digital identity to provide access, even a social credit score, which is a bit controversial, nevertheless, end-to-end uh, -end solution for blockchain that they want to do as part of their program to urbanize the biggest number of people in human history, 350 million people into 10 cities that they're creating from scratch using blockchain technology, an incredible, unbelievable project using this technology for hopefully social good. Shows you where one can go if you think this through and apply the technology. And again, a number of components that sit with that. Asset registries, that's going to be the new big space that's opening up. You heard about ICOs, a lot of scams and issues that people have had with ICOs. What investors want to do now, and the whole process has swung around from people looking at white papers and throwing money at, at small teams with white papers and no business plan. It's turned around to where people now want to see business plans, they want to see IP, and ideally they want to see assets. So I'm advising the largest investment, one of the largest investment management companies in New York in real estate. Um, now, traditionally, if you wanted to have many shareholders in a piece of real estate, you would have what they call fractional reserve. So you have sell shares to a number of people that then co-own a large-scale development. You can now tokenize that. Same process, it's digital, it's fast, and there's a public record of who's the owner or the transfer of ownership. So these type of solutions are going to change the game completely. Again, we need the regulators on board and this, and this variation from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So what is legal in the United States might not be legal in Canada or in Europe or in Korea for that matter. So that alignment we still need and still needs to come as part of this process. Um, I just spoke in Madrid last week around supply chain management and logistics. Wang Chiang, if I pronounce it correctly, the largest motor vehicle parts manufacturer in China, now puts all their parts on the blockchain. So you can literally see the life cycle of a vehicle part from when it's created to when it's recycled eventually, years later. Who sold it? Who owned it? Uh, was it verified? Was it a guaranteed part? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. Walmart, two weeks ago in the United States, declared that from 2019, all providers of goods to Walmart, which is one of the largest retailers in the world, will be providing their goods listed and recorded on a blockchain. And it's the only way that they feel at scale they can manage the quality of the goods, the source of the goods, who the providers are, and so on and so forth. And they get paid more quickly in this fashion which is a big deal. If you're in the retail industry, the margins are small, you have to operate at scale, and you can see how this technology can be applied in that space. Value exchange. This is one of my favorite topics, and that's why I'm now in the exchange business. How value is created, how it is distributed nationally, internationally, and I think the trade wars that we're having, if we like it or not, just emphasizes boundaries still between different nations in the world and different territories, which really is going to create a lot of opportunities, but challenges as well for these technologies, for communication systems, for the transfer of value across the world. At the same time, access. I get a lot of people approaching me from everywhere, from India, I haven't had many people from Korea yet, from Russia, you name it, who want to do web design, who want to help write articles. So it's, it's an opportunity for people on the ground to participate in a very democratic fashion, offer goods and services. At the same time, the regulation and crossing national boundaries has not caught up with these realities. Even the EU bringing nations together in one big trading block has not been easy. If blockchain can help with that, for B2C, C2C, government to business, government to, to, to a consumer or citizen, uh, again, big opportunities and challenges. Fintech, I've shared with you what is happening in the fintech space. We've just seen the start of that. Um, we've heard talk about institutional investors starting to come on board. I think everyone was caught off sides in 2018 with this big bubble. 
that burst, which was just pure speculation and greed that was driving that market. I don't even call that a bubble. It was a natural correction, as far as I'm concerned. Two-thirds of the underlying of the value of what was in the cryptocurrency prices was just people speculating. The real value we'll see in 2019 and beyond as these applications start pulling through from ICOs and startups and ventures that have become sustainable in this process, which is only going to be a small fraction of those that we see around today, but that's nature. That's, that's how, uh, the nature of business and how these things uh, work. So in FinTech, you're going to hear announcements daily. I meet people from New York, from Wall Street to Bay Street in Toronto to uh, Deutsche Börse, where I've just been in Frankfurt. Um, everyone is now starting to step into the space. You haven't seen the public announcements or the money flow yet, but we will shortly. Again, it's the regulators. Money, at the end of the day, will only go where there's certainty. If there's uncertainty, money stays away. So the regulators are necessary to create stability and, and certainty. And once each nation, and hopefully in, in alignment in, in years to come, are creating stability for the money to flow. Otherwise, we're sitting with other people's money in an environment where we cannot guarantee returns and we cannot guarantee that they won't lose their money until there's a stable, measured, and accountable platform. The next big challenge is, and I don't want to get too technical, but for those who are working with change management, if you've done digital transformation projects in your businesses, in government, in your enterprise, same thing. The big challenge for specifically digital commerce, e-commerce as we used to call it, blockchain and its range of applications that's emerging, and the new tokenization of value, similar to uh, the exchange of communication on the internet, we now see the exchange of value thanks to the blockchain. So where these come together and interoperate is the new dynamic. And in 2014, I wrote a paper, it's a bestseller on Amazon, the FinTech book, um, made a contribution there and set out the terms for which this new economy, the fourth, what we now call the fourth industrial revolution, will start to materialize and provide real social and investment and commercial benefit to audiences such as your own and, and one of the Asian tigers, which is, is Southern Korea. So we see applications and big data. The big data firms, predictive analytics, coming up strong as an opportunity in this space. Cybersecurity, I can't say enough about that. I sit on the Cybersecurity Roundtable for Canada, um, working with various nations. It will only become more of an issue as we go forward for a variety of reasons. Um, the technology is just getting, becoming so good. Internet of value and internet of assets, as I like to call it. Machine-to-machine uh, -machine learning, internet of things. Automation is allowing things to talk to each other and make decisions on our behalf, which is where the so-called smart contracts or instruction sets attached to tokens or tokenization or the blockchain comes into play. That's still an untapped market, huge potential and opportunity in that space. Artificial intelligence and robo-advisors. Uh, I also start to, to add things like quantum computing. I understand from my American colleagues that we're going to see the first commercial applications of quantum computing in 2019. There's a race going on which has all kinds of implications for security, uh, encryption on blockchains is a vulnerability, but there's already new algorithms being designed and have been deployed, might not be in the public domain yet, that are quantum proof. So good things to know if you start entering this business and, and start making investments. So we heard earlier on cryptocurrencies, it's kind of came and gone with this bubble so-called Probably 90% of the 2,000 cryptocurrencies that you see listed on CoinMarketCap are gone and, and likely, in my opinion, won't come back. But it sets the stage for those who survive and new ones to come. What we have now is crypto commodities. Again, raw digital resources, people get rewarded for selling storage or processing power on their computers, even their mobile devices, 
and get token, tokenized value in return. Uh, tokenized assets, I can't say enough about that, but pretty much saying goes, anything that can be tokenized will be tokenized. Last year we said everything that could be decentralized could be decentralized. We've moved on from that. So a whole new platform starting to emerge. And of course, crypto art and collectibles. In Korea, like myself, you're, you're, you're big into gaming. I love gaming. And even converting that into loyalty points and rewarding people through loyalty and tokenized loyalty is a big new emerging opportunity in the global entertainment, media, and social exchange market. So a lot of information here, but it just summarizes what I've just said, is that digital asset management and value exchange is the new mature play that's emerging. And that will cross over between these new inventions, new blockchain plot platforms and interoperability that's being created, and your traditional platforms. Remember, the incumbents still hold your data. You're still their customer. They're not going to give that away, but they will use blockchain and these new technologies to enhance your experience. So no big surprise. Um, closed and open digital economy market spaces, if we like it or not. Uh, I always use the two comparisons. You have Apple, what we call a closed garden uh, technology. Everything is owned and controlled by Apple. You pay Apple, you get everything within the Apple environment. Think of that as your private blockchain uh, equivalent. And then you have your open market, which is more your Amazon or the Linux uh, type applications, which is open source, open participation. That's more your public blockchain thing. And these two worlds will compete and, and overlap at the same time with many opportunities. Again, the convergence of other applications IoT, machine-to-machine -machine learning, data, um, we'll see more mature and evolved solutions entering that space quite rapidly. But again, fresh challenges for interoperab interoperability, compliance, and regulation across the world. So I mentioned this before, value creation, value management, value exchange is the name of the game. And again, we don't have time to go into the detail here, but again, decentralized and centralized ownership of goods and services, the uh, management thereof, which is your brokers, broker dealers across the world, and the aggregation of information, and then the exchange of that value is why the majority of initiatives in the blockchain space are exchanges. Everyone has seen this opportunity. There's a whole gold rush into this space happening as we speak. In terms of the ecosystem, and this is a study we did for the Canadian government and a few other governments as well, we're starting to see different sectors integrate or linking with these technologies and taking advantage and even leapfrogging into their markets uh, solution sets. And not enough time to go through this, but globalization, service verticals becoming interoperable, and KYC and AML through RegTech, and blockchain-enabled solution sets and automation is starting to come into play. So what we are offering through Quantex, which is an initiative that we uh, registered offshore outside of Canada, the main body of the team is in Canada, but we've set up shop in Bermuda and launching this exchange in Europe, um, is taking advantage of what used to be handwritten ledgers, and this is the business processes that we've inherited, have been around for the last 80 years, so it's not gonna go away if you deal with NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange or the Hang Seng or whatever. This is how they manage information and investments today. But it's moving through cryptocurrencies, virtual assets, and securities into a market that's gonna be trillions of dollars. So arguably, this is gonna be the biggest transformation of capital in human history, where we're gonna be able to tokenize any value. So where we used to walk around with paper notes, guaranteeing that you'll get paid whatever value is written on this piece of paper, it'll become digital. There's no other way we can move into the future without utilizing these technologies, and we wanna take advantage of that. So we can see trading and, and the engine that we've created uh, allows for 10 million transactions a second, working off-chain, linking with blockchain solution sets, and we work with a number of decentralized exchanges that because they are decentralized by nature, 
cannot scale, cannot trade as fast, but they're looking for liquidity pools. They need custodial. If you want to do this in Canada and the United States, you need to be able to offer custodial services. You need to provide insurance, which doesn't exist yet for blockchain and cryptocurrencies, but it's coming. Um, and that will allow us to minimize costs, speed up these things, and globalize these ventures. So what, we, what we've seen happen in your traditional exchanges and scale quite dramatically is what we are now seeing emerging into, thanks to blockchain and cryptocurrency style solutions, entering the space as well. So we'll see new crypto exchanges emer emerging that will be able to scale beyond traditional exchanges. So we see this overtaking traditional exchanges in years to come. Not tomorrow. This is, this is a three to five year build out, but it shows you what the opportunities still are for the space. So again, I mentioned investment services, custody, and liquidity enablement becomes the keystones to what a future exchange that's going to be sustainable should be able to offer. And this is just the business process involved in delivering, in our case, a solution to institutions, I net with individuals, and also crypto banking. So we've created, and in conclusion, uh, what is called Block Forum International. We're launching it at the World Economic Forum in January next year. It will be the inaugural event where we're bringing leaders in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space together with government, the IMF, the World Economic Forum, to talk about how we align jurisdictions across the world and enable governments and people uh, who are ready to embrace this technology in a positive way and learning from best practice and examples in the space. Again, not enough time, but there'll be a round table. Anyone is interested, please reach out. Um, and we plan to have these round tables across the world in jurisdictions that are ready and, and feel the need to learn from other nations uh, in terms of what is applicable for you on your terms in Korea, for instance. So again, thank you very much for your time. I hope that was of interest and thank you very much for having me. Cheers. 네, 뜨거운 박수 부탁드립니다.